Welcome to the Vortex Nation podcast, brought to you by lovers of hunting, shooting, public lands, the Second Amendment, and good food. We got a cool one for you guys today. We're going to be talking about reloading ammunition, or in some cases, just loading ammunition, I think. Uh, so, in this case, essentially making your own cartridges, which I know could be interpreted a lot of different ways. But we're going to be talking about that stuff here with Jimmy Jordan and Tom Leatherberry, two new guys onto the podcast. Oh, I'm supposed to say this too. If you happen to blow your face off with any of the knowledge that we give here, or you try reloading immediately after listening to this podcast or while listening to this podcast, and uh, and that happens, we are not liable. Okay. I good? I think, I think that covers it. Oh, whew. Okay. Back to Jimmy and Tom Leatherberry. We got Jimmy on the mic here, and then another Jimmy, Jimmy Jordan. And, uh, and Tom, why don't you guys introduce yourselves real quick? What do you do? Who are you? Sure. I'm Jim Jordan. I work in the consumer sales team here at Vortex Optics, just taking care of customers day in, day out, phone calls, emails, just helping people who walk in the door. So, And you do some reloading, right? I do reload. Yep. What, I, uh, what primarily do you do it for? Well, several cartridges. Um, well, target and hunting application. 223, 308, 6.5 by 47, tons of random ones for my brother and friends and stuff too. So Perfect. Yeah. Tom? I'm uh, Tom Leatherberry. I work in dealer sales. I've been at Vortex for eight years. I uh, manage the Midwestern territory, so I work primarily with dealers, and I've been reloading for about the last seven or eight years. Grendel is my nickname. There it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. If you wouldn't say it, somebody else was. I knew you would. Uh, so I obviously reload for the Grendel. I'm a big 6mm Creedmoor fan, 6.5 Creedmoor. Basically, uh, any of the, I don't know, boutique cartridges that have come out in the last 5, 10 years, that's got my name on it. So. Boutique. That's an interesting way to describe it. Yeah. So then, in addition to these guys, we got Ryan Muckenhern, frequent guest, and then obviously Mark sitting next to me here too. So we're going to talk about reloading. It's it's kind of a weird subject that Ryan Muckenhern earlier you described it as what weird people do in their basements. Correct. <laughs> that is factual. <laughs> and so uh, what what is it? What is Reload? It's fairly self-explanatory with the name. Obviously, yeah. you're essentially it, like those people at the range that are all like scouring the ground, picking up brass. Mm -hmm. Brass they're, rats. They're looking to, brass rats. Yes, they're looking to they reload that brass. Is Correct. that right? Now, yeah. hold on. Before we get too deep, I want to bring up something that you guys, I don't think, are aware of. This ammunition, it actually comes per 20 <laughs> in a package somebody, ready to go. Somebody, I don't know if you guys, is. I think you guys are maybe making it a little too difficult or hard on yourselves. So I thought I'd <laughs> fill you in on that little fact and that might influence you moving forward. Well, that kind of ruins this great business idea I had where you would actually maybe reload four people and they might buy pre-reload, preloaded ammunition. I don't know if that has any legs to it. It may people have been do done it. already. <laughs> It's something to definitely put in, in the consideration yeah. pile. So so people are... Oh, shoot. I, I should have reminded myself, too. Before we get too deep in this, I want to talk... We're going to say some terminology here. Let's try and get through this real quick. We're going to say some terms here that might not make sense to people who don't reload. There's a lot of things that make uh, about reloading that don't make sense to people who don't reload. Anyway, annealing, that's a term. What is it? It is the application of controlled heat to a cartridge case, so the brass case after it's been fired to change the temper of the metal. Okay. So when we fire a cartridge case inside of a, a rifle's chamber, it's, a, it's subjected to a ton of heat and forces, and it, it becomes what's called work-hardened. And when it becomes work-hardened, it becomes brittle, and it will lower the number of times you can reload a particular case, and it can also change the dynamic of how the neck interacts with the bullet. And um, That's a fairly advanced reloading step. Uh, you'll see a lot of guys in the, in the precision rifle and bench rest arenas doing uh, annealing, but uh, it is very useful. Yeah, so when you look at a cartridge, when you take it out of a box, whether you buy new ammunition or, or, or you've seen reloaded ammunition, it's got kind of that purplish uh, rainbow hue to the top third of the cartridge, so just below the shoulder forward to the top of the case mouth. That is a case that has been annealed. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Makes it softer. Okay. What is neck turning? Neck turning. Sounds like something they do in those movies where there's like an assassin. Yeah. And they just really quick you put somebody quick, out. Yep, turn the neck. Uh, Steven Seagal pioneered neck turning, I believe. Uh, <laughs> so neck Fine turning. Actor. Yeah. It's a process in which you remove material from the neck of the case itself to reduce its outer dimension. So if there's too much brass, 
at that point. You cut it away with a special tool called a neck turning tool, and it literally just cuts brass off the outside of it. Um, usually you see that when you're making cartridges from another cartridge, which is, is kind of really where I think reloading got a lot of its feet. So if we're taking a 30 out 6 case and we're turning it into a 308 case, or if we're taking a 308 case and turning it into a 6.5 Creedmoor case, or something of those sorts, you will end up with excess material around the neck uh, to the point in which you may not be able to chamber the round. So you neck turn and it will all fit. Do you guys do any neck turning? So I don't. Neck turning or annealing, interestingly enough, I don't do either. Oh. Um, like Ryan said, you know, if you're wildcatting or making a cartridge from another cartridge, that's really where that neck turning thing comes more into play. I think a lot of people talk about like the concentricity of the case, and um, I think one of the things we'll probably address today is just how all of us handle the reloading thing a little bit differently. Uh, I think it all comes down to what your intents and purposes are and what you're looking to get out of that reloading experience. So I choose not to neck turn. I choose not to anneal. By annealing, you increase the life of the cartridge. Uh, you probably get more reloadings than I do, but as I have a huge bin of brass downstairs, probably of 1,500 or 2,000 pieces of once-fired Creedmoor brass, I just don't see a need to do either of those operations. So, hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah, I don't have an annealing machine. I don't send my stuff off to get annealed either. Um, I just live with the fact that I'm going to get less reloadings out of the brass, and then I throw it away when I think it's had too much and buy new stuff. So, Very interesting. All yeah. right. All right. Now, another one, I had to ask Ryan Muckner about this one because I said, hey, what are some weird terms that reloaders use? He said swaging. Mm -hmm. what, what the heck is that? I Actually, at first when, I when we wrote it down, I thought it said swagging, which I think is something that, that the, hip, the hippity hopsters do. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so swaging in reloading can have a lot of different uses and, and names. I think uh, most of us would look specifically at primer pockets or where the primer is actually inserted into the case. And you need to occasionally remove a feature that has been mechanically placed there uh, to retain the primer. So you have to force that material out of the way. You swage it out of the way so that you can reload it. You can actually put a primer in it. So a lot of military cases for, for the guys out there who are looking to get into shooting 308 or 223, even 30 out six, and now soon, hopefully, 6.5 Creedmoor, excuse me, um, you may have to swage your primer pocket. So you use a special tool that kind of pushes brass out of the way in the primer pocket so that you can put a new primer in. Hmm. I yeah. just want to point out that you almost said Grendel, I and I got really excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yikes. Let's, let's carry on. We'll get back to some of this stuff, yeah. too. Right now, we're just going through terminology for those of you listening. Let, let's talk about, too, so, so a cartridge is the entire thing when it's all put together. And I think a lot of times people will look at something and they'll say, uh, you know, they'll look at a finished cartridge and say, oh, it's a bullet. But actually, a cartridge is made up, it has a bullet in it, but it's made up of a bullet, which is the actual little thing at the tip. It's the little rock that you're going to fling to the target eventually. The projectile. The projectile. Mm -hmm. yep. I like little rock for some reason. I just sound like a total It's a good city, too. Yeah. It's a good city, too. Um, Jim throw rock. Yeah. Mm, Gunpowder. It steel. Then there's the brass. That's the actual, or the case, is that right? Yep. That's the actual, like, gold thing that holds the projectile. I'm doing a terrible job. <laughs> the primer is the little hockey puck at the base of it that you your firing pin hits. And then, essentially, when the firing pin hits the primer, it creates a spark that ignites the grains of powder inside, right? Yep. Correct. So you've got brass, primer, powder, bullet. Am I missing anything? That's the, the whole shebang. That's the whole shebang. That's called then the cartridge. I mentioned one word. I said it, and it's a word that's confusing to me sometimes because it grains. There's grain weight bullets, like a 55 grain, 5.56 five, or whatever, 2.23. But then also there's grains of powder, right? Don't they measure it that way? What, what's the deal with grains? Why do they use it so much? Well, there's 7,000 grains in a, in a pound, and huh. that, that grain is the same weight correct me if I'm wrong, but the grain is the same weight for the bullet as it is for the powder. So if you had 143 grains of a bullet or 143 grains of powder, they both weigh the same. Oh, really? Yeah. A lot of times, I think one of the one of the things that I didn't understand right away is, you know, when you pour powder out on the table or it spills out on the table, I initially thought that each one of those was a grain of powder. That's what I thought. Um, so 7,000 little kernels wouldn't necessarily equal a pound. A grain is a unit of measure, not necessarily uh, tied right. to... The actual gran, I guess it'd be a granule of powder, or is that what you would call it? I mean, kernel. yellow kernel. kernel. Yeah. It's kernel. British. Yeah. Ah, that well, then, explains it. 
you know, that does make sense that you look at different powders, right? There's different different shaped powders. There's different, yep. you know, as a, when you're, I guess when you're looking at the individual grain, not the measure of a grain, but an individual grain, there's a wide variety of yep. yeah. of things there. I mean, mm-hmm. and, all and sorts of them. I think probably some of those are specific to types of cartridges, types of, you know, oh, types yeah. of cartridges or yeah. whether you're rolling shotgun or rifle or pistol. Yep. Or, yep. Very that is true. So, the, okay, that's kind of some of the phrases and things I want to get out of the way before we talk about this, because now, now let's get into the meat of it. Why would someone want to reload? What's the big deal with reloading? Or there's also loading, not, not reloading, but there's also loading. What, what's the deal? Some people say, oh, I reload for accuracy. Some people say it's to save money, which I kind of don't really think it does. Depends. And, you know, some people <laughs> do might. it for competition because they want mass quantities or just think it's fun. Ryan, you like to watch Netflix while you do it or whatever. Yeah. What's, uh, what, what is it? How about maybe for each one of you guys? Jimmy's or, a big prepper. Big yeah, prepper yep, over here. Yep, that's true. That's right. <laughs> I've, seen a chef, I've seen a Chef Boyardee collection, man. It's a real <laughs> thing. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> I do it mostly for fun and the personal enjoyment of being able to make my own. Um, a lot of times I find that I'm able to wring out just a little bit more accuracy out of my own personal hand loads than I am out of standard factory ammunition. Um, a lot of times the consistency of the velocity of the cartridge is also, uh, a, it's a tighter consistency than what I find out of, out of a lot of um, match ammunition. But, but it depends. That's, that's not always true. There's, there's so much match ammunition that's super consistent. I, I do it because it's fun. I, I don't usually save money. It depends on the cartridge, and, and it depends on how much you shoot. If, if you have a cartridge that's very expensive to purchase factory ammo for, then you might, you might save. I definitely don't save time doing it, but, but I just, I just <laughs> like it. I just like it. It's fun. So yeah. yeah. Depends on the cartridge too. Um, 5.56, I'll shoot that high volume and I'm maybe a little less concerned with accuracy and consistency out of it. That might be more what I'm using for plinking, in which case I'll just buy a lot of cheap factory ammunition for my 6.5 by 47, though I exclusively hand load for it you know, just going for accuracy and, and of course, and for that particular caliber money savings as well. Okay. Tom? Uh, I think when I got into reloading, one of the most valuable tips that somebody gave me was if you're looking to reload to save money, don't. If you're looking to reload to shoot more and to shoot more accurately, then do. I certainly found that to be the case early on. What do you mean Uh, when you say shoot more? Because now I'm starting to think like saving money. Well, yes, but what you end up doing is you end up, you end up losing that money in time you know, oh, at, at the bench. Okay. So the investment uh, of the equipment. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you'll find is that you'll spend literally hours at the reloading bench, resizing and doing all this stuff. And so the per cartridge cost might be low, correct. Or lower. Yeah. And because you have everything in your basement, you've got 16 pounds of powder and 5,000 primers and bullets. Like it creates the illusion that it's free. And so you end up oh. shooting, you yeah. end up shooting more. <laughs> That's true. You know, I mean, it, it's really easy for people to come over to your house and say, Hey, can you help me load up some six, five Creedmoor? And you've got fully prepped brass. And they're like, Oh, this is really easy. You just throw some powder and a primer in there and you put a bullet in there. But there was about two or three days of work that went into prepping all of that brass before it got to that point. So like I said, in the beginning, I got into it because I wanted to shoot more accurately. And I think thanks to our friends over at Hornady, they, uh, they've made that a lot harder for me to do meaning that I can't get the velocities that, that they're getting out of some of their ammunition safely, and it's so darn accurate that I, I really don't feel a need or a desire to, to load as much of that stuff as I once did. So I guess I load more today for more of, like, the, the specialty stuff. Um, you know, like the Grendel, you can buy factory ammo, but I can't get that to quite shoot as well as I would like. The Valkyrie, you can buy ammunition for, but I haven't found any factory loads that, that I like for that, so... Those are two cartridges that I load for now, but like 223, 308, 65 Creed, 6 Creed, those types of things, I just go to that. I think it's the same stuff that Mark was talking about earlier, that you just go to the store and there's these neatly designed boxes that usually hold 20 <laughs> cartridges, and uh, you can buy them and they're ready to fire. It's pretty crazy. It's a pretty so, slick deal. Yeah. Yeah. It, wow. Someone's really thinking. While this is fresh in our brains, too, and I want to get over to Ryan Mugginer because I know he he reloads like all the time in mass quantities. But you you both have mentioned something now where you say that you can squeeze a little bit more accuracy out of your reloads or maybe like a factory load doesn't shoot as good as some of your hand loads do. What's going on with that that makes your hand loads shoot so much better than a factory? And this isn't to knock factory ammunition, by the way, at all. Like there's tons of really good factory ammunition out out there that you can get. Match grade stuff is, is awesome. They're making it in 
huge quantities, right? So understandably so, you would think that if you're in your basement taking the care and the time to personalize a, a special cartridge for your rifle, you might be able to squeeze a little bit more accuracy out of it in your particular rifle. But what, what are you guys doing differently than is done in these mass-produced cartridges? I think with, you know, one of the things with the mass-produced cartridge is that they're designing that cartridge for, you know, a multitude of platforms, a bunch of different rifles. So they're probably making some concessions here and there to make it run well in as many guns as they can. And I think a lot of it is just about kind of tuning the load to the gun. Mine might not be as fast or I might not be shooting the same way to projectile, but that's just the combination that that particular gun likes. I might have uh, some factory ammo that doesn't shoot at all in my 6.5 Grendel, and you might have a, a Grendel that we go out to the range with, and the factory ammo shoots well in your gun, and my reloads don't shoot well in your gun. So I think it's just all about finding that right combination of the two. Is that like how things like the cases are shaped, or is that like does that have to do with your gun, how the feed ramps are, how the barrel's twisted, how it's cut? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of things that play into it. You know, you might be measuring your powder charges more precisely than an ammunition that's mass produced or an ammunition company that's producing ammunition on a large scale. You know, they might not be measuring it quite as consistently um, as you are. They might not be seeding the bullet at a depth that puts it at the optimal distance from the lands in your particular rifle. Hmm. They're setting it up at a, at a depth that this will work really well for a wide range of platforms, whereas you know, also your how particular far you push the bullet down into the neck. Correct. Yeah. Yep. How how far the the ogive of the bullet, the the part that'll actually become wide enough to contact the the rifling on the on the barrel, how close you're getting that to the the lands they call it. So yeah, the depth that you seat the bullet at that matters. The work you put in for case preparation. You know, sometimes you know sometimes you want to do a little bit more to the primer pockets or or clean more more thoroughly, for instance. You know, all of those things are little details that can make you more consistent across the board with, with your rifle. Jimmy just, Jimmy just brought up another term, you know, lands, which I think maybe a lot of folks may or may not be familiar with, but I mean, any of you guys want to describe, you know, lands and grooves and yeah, I guess what the heck how is that's that? working? Yeah, sure. That's just the rifling of the barrel where the rifling begins is, is referred to as the lands. So the rifling inside of the barrel is their, their grooves cut into the barrel that contact the jacket of the bullet. And as the bullet passes down the barrel, it causes the bullet to spin. That's what gives it its its spiral spin. Right. It leaves the barrel. Right, and there's yeah. different twist rates and things like that, which a twist rate is essentially uh, how tightly those spirals go. You know, it could be, yeah. like, if you see a one in seven twist, that means that it twists one full time around in seven inches, right? Correct. One yeah. in eight means one full time around in eight inches. So if you see a one in seven, that's a tighter faster spiral, twist. faster twist. Mm-hmm. Then a one and eight, one and nine, stuff like that, right? Correct. Yeah, and typically, the the heavier the projectile you have, the faster twist required to stabilize that projectile. Lighter projectile you have, you can get away with the slower twist. Okay. And so, when you're messing around with this stuff, it, it, when you're loading your ammunition, do you like load a bunch, take them out to the ra- range, and shoot them, and then you're like, nah, that kind of sucked. You know, I'll take it back, I'll load a bunch again, but I'll change something. How do you like? How do you decide when you want to change something when you're when you're set with it? Like, okay, I'm done changing stuff. I think that largely depends on the reloader that Where you're you talking are. to. Yeah. yeah, everybody does it a little bit differently. I know there's some uh, calculations out there for what they call like optimal charge weight. Ryan probably knows more about that than I do. You know, and then there's ladder tests, but there's different types of ladder tests. What I generally do is I consult a couple of different reloading books of whatever bullet powder combination I think I want, and I look to see what similarities they are. And then I usually load up, you know, three cartridges of of each charge weight. And I usually start out with like three tenths of a grain separation. And then I go out to the range and shoot it and see which ones show promise and then kind of narrow narrow it down from there. But there's other ways to do like ladder tests at distance and try to figure out where the accuracy node is. And um, like I said, everybody does it a little bit differently, but I usually just go to the reloading manual. I always start out wherever they recommend and then I kind of take a look at the individual groups and, and see which ones show promise and kind of work from there. What manuals are you looking at? Uh, you know, the Hornady. Um, I get that little hydrogen magazine that they produce. I have the I have the um, Sierra book and then a lot of online stuff as well. Yeah. So I don't know if it still exists, but one of the places that I used quite a bit in the early days was called Reloader's Nest, and it was just a kind of a, 
a group of reloaders that had all kind of gotten together and were sharing information. But whenever possible, I try to take the information from the horse's mouth, the horse being the manufacturer. And so I, I tend to rely more on Hodgton and Hornady and, and Sierra for for the data. Okay. So, Jimmy, how about you? And Tom mentioned one thing, too, like the node, the accuracy yep. node. Isn't that essentially like once you've been testing out some stuff, you find a certain point where you're not getting any better than that? Where it, it's exceptionally accurate at this particular powder charge. So my process is a lot like Tom's. I'll start at whatever the manufacturer recommends I start at. And then from there, I'll work up five cartridges every 0.3 grains up. Okay, so eventually what you'll get to is you're looking for a couple of things. You're looking for accuracy. You're looking for the consistency and velocity. And then you're also looking for pressure mm. signs because if, if you start loading too hot, you'll, you'll eventually either start flattening primers, you'll get a stiff bolt lift, and all that's unsafe to continue. You don't want to load any, any hotter. Once you see a sign like that, stop immediately and back off. That's your, that's your limit. So those are the things you're looking for. So within the safe range of what you're able to load for your rifle and cartridge combination, you'll eventually find a place where there's accuracy that's exceptional. You might have several. You might have several places that are very accurate. And from there, then you, you would look at other factors like how consistent is my velocity at each of those accuracy nodes. And, and then, you know, this one's, this one's faster, but this one might be more consistent. So then it might depend what you're doing with it. Are you working up a hunting cartridge, in which case I might trade, I might prefer a slightly flatter trajectory over saving those five feet per second for an extreme spread. Or if I'm a PRS competitor, for instance, I you know might go for the consistency or a bench rest shooter, for instance, might go for the consistency over the little bit of extra velocity. And some of the guys will chase speed too. Yep. And then, you know, one of the reasons I'm not a, I'm not a speed guy, I don't do any competition stuff. I don't do much hunting. So I'm willing to accept a lower node because I don't wear my equipment as much. I don't wear the brass as much. I don't, you know, I, I get more use out of it. I don't have to worry about pressure spikes or anything like that. Jimmy alluded to the limit of the cartridge and like in the powder combination. And I didn't realize, I didn't understand when I first got into reloading that the limit changes with the temperature with a lot of the different powders. So yeah. your limit might be different at... 35 degrees than it is at 80 degrees so always watch oh the ambient temperature that you're in correct oh okay yeah huh so essentially what you're getting at too and just to reiterate the node thing a node is like if you had a chart of different things you've tried yep the nodes are essentially the ones you've circled that you want to go back to yep Yep. right this combination works really well it's either super consistent for velocity or it's super accurate is it weird to get behind a rifle that has like cartridges that you loaded the first time, the first, yeah. first time it is, yeah, yeah. I remember my first time for sure. Did you? Yeah. Did you? Were you actually behind the rifle, or did you like? Yeah, I shot with, him with yeah. a string, like yeah, no, from <laughs> afar. No, I shot him. I, I, I remember shooting him. I got behind it, and yep. Mm. Okay, I'll never forget it. I yeah. didn't have a string. I did use my <laughs> own hands to touch it off, but I was not sitting on the rifle. <laughs> so, yeah. Every uh, every time I get behind cartridges, Tom's loaded. Super nervous. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I hear you. You never know what he's going to do. Sometimes sometimes Tom's a little unpredictable. Ryan, yep. let's go back to you real fast here, too, because... So, Jimmy, you mentioned you do some, like, 223 reloading and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I know, Ryan, you do a lot of that. Like, some days you come in, and it's like, hey, how was your weekend? Ryan's like, dude, I just watch TV, and I loaded 9 mil all day. Yeah. So what's your, is your reasoning behind loading, like, is it like therapeutic? Do you just enjoy it? Is it so you can shoot a ton? Is it like? It, it's really multifaceted. So I guess I'll back up. I started reloading when I was, I think I got my first press when I was like 12 or 13 years old. And uh, I I just felt it was the thing to do as a young man. Like this was, uh, you know, like trapping and uh, going out and catching fish and eating stuff outside in the woods. Like it was just a manly thing to do. And, and I had been reading a lot of outdoor magazines and, and books and things like this. And everybody, you know, talked about being this adept shooter. They all reloaded. And so I thought I had to do this. So I, I talked my grandfather into, quote, unquote, loaning me the money. I still haven't paid him back. Don't tell <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it kind of got me going on this. And then, and then I think around the time I was about 16, when I started big game hunting, then I really started loading quite a bit. And it was really more to find answers to questions that probably didn't need to be Post, but uh, like I wanted the better bullet. I wanted the the most accurate. I wanted the most consistent. I wanted the strongest, hardest hitting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, so a lot of my rifle loading came out of a quest for the perfect hunting cartridge or the perfect combination of bullet and, and particular cartridge, depending on what I was hunting with. Fast forward a few years, uh, prior to working here at Vortex, I, wor- I worked for a company that uh, we did a lot of three-gun shooting and action sh- action shooting, USPSA pistol and tactical pistol, things like this. And so the volume of cartridges that I was shooting was, and, and at the time too, sociopolitically, was, it was almost unattainable. Like on the wages that I was making, I could not afford to keep up with my my diet of ammunition. And so I got into a different style of reloading called progressive reloading, which is I use a machine that's not automated, it's still hand actuated, but for every pull of the lever, I make a cartridge, it auto indexes, sets up my my next case, my next powder charge, my next primer, does everything as as automated as it could. It's the one where like you put, there's like four different, I don't know how many you have on there, but there's like yeah. Four different things happening at once with yep. one pull of the lever. Correct. Yeah. So it's and there's like a little spinny table thing on the top of it. Yeah. That so so it, it uses a I probably series. Did not help anybody. No, that's, that's the technical term. Spinny, spinny table. Spinny is the table. Term. Yeah. I've got the manual. You can see it in there. Spinny table. No way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, another term we should have talked about is dies. So when you when you talk about reloading, uh, you'll hear the term die, and all a die is is a specialized tool that executes a process. So like you have in, in typically in rifle loading, like a, a bottleneck cartridge, you'll have a resizing die and decapping die. Generally they're combined. You can have a neck sizing die and then you'll have a seating die. So each one of these dies accomplishes a process. We should back up a little bit further yet. And then we have single stage or progressive presses. So a single stage press, you have a single die put in you have a single pull. It accomplishes a single thing. So like when Jim is loading his 6547, he sets his resize decap die up. He'll do a lot of brass. Resizes a bunch of brass. So like Correct. he'll do that one process over and over and over and over. Yep. yep. And you have a pile of them. Then he'll go through another process, you know, whether it's uh, case prep or whatever, cleaning, so on and so forth. And then he'll do all his loading. He'll do his powder dumping, priming, et cetera, et cetera. And then he'll just seat the bullets. And that in itself is another die. So single stage, uh, progressive, you have all of those dies on what's called a tool head. Uh, so they're arranged generally in a circular or square pattern uh, on top of your press, which resembles uh, its single stage counterpart only very vaguely. Um, and then it has an automated turret system or mechanical turret system that when you actuate a lever, it actually moves uh, mm-hmm. a shell plate or a shell holder, as they call it. And the cases go kind of merry-go-round up into these dies as you're doing it. So it, it looks like, um, if you've ever seen the movie Edward Scissor's Hands mm-hmm. in the opening scene where they're making all the cookies, it kind of looks like that. And it, you know, it reminds me of making cookies in large quantity. But um, So yeah, long story short, I got into progressive type reloading when I was shooting competitively, um, action shooting. And so I was able to, with my current machine, load around 1,000 rounds an hour. So it goes. So with very little effort, I'm able to turn out high-volume ammunition uh, that's really good quality. The machine's really good, so the consistency is exceptional with it. I can't say anything but good about progressive reloading for that style of thing. But I also load a lot on a single stage, and for much of the same reasons that Jim and Tommy have talked about as well, another reason that I reload is is necessity with some things, whether it's a cartridge that I can't buy off the shelf or you know, a cartridge that's extremely expensive, like I shoot a 300 Weatherby and the ammunition that I like to load or excuse me, the bullet type I like to load in it, they're approaching $100 a box for 20 of those. Whoa. Yeah, so they're very expensive. Once you ha- have attained the brass to do this, which is really the the, the vehicle that a, a cartridge requires to succeed because powder is powder, primers are primers, bullets are bullets. Once you have the brass case, and, and if you have careful and, and um, you know judicious and religious reloading practices, you can load them multiple times. I think for me to load a box of 300 Weatherby, I'm doing it for around fourteen to sixteen bucks instead of a hundred. After you've basically correct absorbed right the after you made right. yeah, the yeah investment and in all the yeah. stuff it correct takes to do it. and you know so that's another good example of kind of why I reload or cases to to what Tom had mentioned earlier cases that don't exist. So there's wildcats is a term you're going to hear that's generally a, a case that has been created from either another case or completely manufactured in home custom cases made that's very uncommon i there's you got to make a custom rifle if you make a whole custom yeah case, right yeah yeah or at least 
barrel or something. I don't yeah, know. Ge- generally speaking, it's a it's a full operation. Like we're not just looking at a particular cartridge; it's everything else. But you know, wildcatting I think really died off probably in the mid nineties, you know, for a long time, especially post World War II, post Vietnam, there was like this big resurgence in, in reloading at home. Um, now we had metallic com- and, and cartridge components available after the war uh, or wars, I should say. And shooters were, were looking for something more out of their antiquated cartridges and they were wild catting. So Tom has a couple of wildcat cartridges that are really neat. 22 Creed more and, and, 22 Grendel, I believe you have both, don't you? And I have a six Grendel as well. Yeah, so something he can't buy off a shelf. It doesn't technically exist, but Tom makes it. Another thing too, Jim's got one, uh, a cartridge that I'm really fond of. Uh, It's a very old cartridge, a 6.5 by 55 Swedish Mauser. Um, First cartridge I reloaded with. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what's really special about this cartridge is in the U.S., if you buy loaded ammunition for it, it's anemic um, because they're they're making this cartridge acceptable for rifles of the of the era and the period that it was originally chambered in. So these are much weaker designed rifles, and um, they're not very strong. Whereas the cartridge itself is remarkably capable. We we have this whole laundry list of six and six five something or another's on on the uh, on the plate available for the shooter, and we forget about the six five by fifty five specifically. And it is a monster of a cartridge when it's loaded to what it is capable of. If you have a modern rifle, as Jim does, you can snooze that thing up, and it makes a six-five Creedmoor look like uh, it belongs on a putting green. But no way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I've never seen you shoot this thing. Is it? It's so a Remington it looks like 700. It's a modern rifle. Yeah. yeah. It's a Remington 700 classic. Is is what it is. Yep. So it it was Remington did that in 1994. They chambered their classic in 6.5 by 55 Swedish, and and I was lucky enough to find one in college and picked it up when I got it and started shooting it. With the factory ammunition, there was only like one or two kinds of factory ammo that I could even find for it to begin with. But I was just so enamored with the idea of the cartridge and how unique and cool and whatever that it was. So I just, yeah, started shooting it. Wasn't as happy with the performance I was getting with the factory ammo that I was able to shoot. You know, I was getting, you know, Remington soft points going 2,600 feet per second, I think. And and with that case, I knew I could get a lot more out of it. And accuracy-wise, too, everything I was shooting was shooting about, you know, inch and a half or so, which is certainly, you know, acceptable for a, you know, moderate distance hunting rifle. But I just knew I could get so much more. And, and you know, with reloading techniques, I was able to get, you know, 140s going well over 2,800 and and half minute accuracy, half, in, half inch group at 100, you know, and that's that's out of a hunting rifle. And that's that's where I stopped. I'm sure it could do better. But, you know, I just knew I that there was more to be gained. And there certainly is. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Gosh, you guys are just blowing my mind over here. <laughs> I'm like trying to trying to direct this, but I I don't reload. I've always it, it's been it's been interesting to me because I could never tell personally like what route if I was going to I'd want to go like for super precision. Like I know my brother Dave has been on here before. He loads six five Creed and he loads it for like some crazy insane yeah. precision. He gets those things hot too. I don't I don't get how it works. I mean he's like pushing insane velocities. Oh yeah. He's pushing like he's pushing like twenty what is it like twenty six or twenty seven hundred out of a sixteen inch barrel yeah. six five green one. Yeah, but he's well within the safe boundaries. And, yeah. and, to, and to Jim's earlier point with his cartridge is six five um, Swedish. A lot of what you're buying on the marketplace is downloaded for liability reasons. You know, yeah. hmm. um, I shoot a three hundred Weatherby as I mentioned. Um, I was loading hundred and thirty grain Barnes TTSXs in that. You couldn't buy this combination loaded from the factory. I was pushing that little pill at 3,650 feet per second. So it's like, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's like a 22,250 with a varmint bullet in it, except I'm I'm now capable of taking antelope and mule deer. And so, yeah, I mean, a shooter can look at a given cartridge and see the available loadings from the factory and become, uh, I guess, disenchanted with what that cartridge's capabilities may appear to be on paper. But as a hand loader with different bullet weights and different powder charges and things like this, you have the ability to unlock capabilities that your cartridge may not on paper seem to have. So, dude, it's totally like motors. Yeah. Look at like an old, yes. look so at like right. an old five zero from a Mustang, yep. and it's just like, bleh, 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 bleh. and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. some dude comes in and just tunes the heck out of yeah. it, and it is a machine. And that's exactly what it is. It is a tuning. It is a tuning. You're tuning your bullets, exactly or Correct. cartridges, I should yeah. say. Yeah, yep. yeah. Now it makes sense. Yeah. This is brilliant. You just got to put it in terms you can understand. Yeah. You just gotta, <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. 
I'm totally like, as a car guy, what bugs me is, you know, like when somebody goes to the lot and they're like, ah, I'll just take it. It's got a sunroof, right? And I'm like, oh, like, you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> please, <laughs> like, understand. And, and, and they're just kind of like, no, dude, I'll just take whatever's available, you know? And then, of course, like, I go into bullet, you know, bullets and cartridges and I'm like, yeah, just give me the Hornady, you know, 6.5 Creedmoor. Yeah. Other people are probably like, you could get so much more. Yeah. Sometimes, though, that will frustrate you, too. You know, like when you spent all that time at the reloading bench and somebody shows up with their factory loaded ammunition. <laughs> yeah. You know, now, here you sit with a custom gun and a, a nice scope and custom ammunition, if you will, and then another guy comes in behind you with an off-the-rack rifle with factory-loaded ammunition. Like I said, there's so much good stuff out there right now. Um, you just have to weigh your time, and if it's something that you're doing because you enjoy it, you should do it, but the time component of it has gotten harder as my kids get older. Uh, they enjoy reloading with me, but it still doesn't change the fact that it's literally hours at the workbench yeah. just to get the cases yeah. ready. Like, I think one of their chores, they're not going to be the typical kids that are going to do dishes and do laundry. They're going to prep brass. Because <laughs> once the brass is prepped, I enjoy that part of it. Um, like, the actual reloading or the loading of the cartridge, I enjoy that. But the prepping of the brass, I I don't enjoy that. So you, you bring up now, I wanted to make sure we talked about these two things, which is, like, what equipment does somebody need? And also, like, what does just the process look like? Because we've mentioned now, like, dyes and presses... And then you've said prepping brass, things like that. I've also done a terrible job at the very beginning of bringing up all the terms necessary because we keep bringing up new terms that we didn't bring up. But can we talk about, like, you're at the range, you're a brass rat. You're picking up a bunch of brass. Let's say it's, uh, or it's your brass, right? So, like, you shoot your 6.5, whatever. What's the process? Obviously, you pick it all up, you take it home. What do you have to do? Everyone's process differs, mm-hmm. but the first thing I'll do is clean. I'll throw it immediately into a tumbler. Different just types like of a... tumblers exist. I've got a corn cob media tumbler. Just keep it basic. Just yeah. throw a bunch of brass in there with, you know, it filled up halfway, two thirds of the way full of corn cob media. Screw down your lid nice and tight, flip it on, and it it goes in the vibratory tumbler for several hours. A lot of times I'll do that and I'll just go to sleep and pull it out in the morning or, or I'll, you know, put it in in the morning and come back after work and pull it out so I know that it's had a ton of time to get clean. And then is that just taking all the rough stuff, like all the burnt powder? All the burnt powder. Yeah, it takes yep, all the carbon off and, and all the dirt and, you know, just it, you don't want to be running a, I think most people would agree that you're not going to, you don't want to run that cartridge uncleaned up into a dye. Um, yeah. You don't want to damage the dye in any way, but hmm. there may be some people that just bring it home from the range and and run it through Size the dyes. There are, yeah. It's, yeah. it's bizarre to me. I just <laughs> I, I, There are guys, especially in, in some of like the bench rest communities, well, they'll have their press on the adjacent bench. They'll fire the cartridge. Granted, they're handling it when it comes out, but it comes out covered in soot and, you know, dirty. And powder. They will they will they even wipe it down or no? No, nah, it's running right in there. Yeah. I mean, that's like Jim said, it's very interesting talking to other reloaders because everybody, you know, everybody has everybody a different, has different mark. Different, huh? Yeah. yeah. Create so, your own ending book. <laughs> so, okay, you threw it in the tumbler and you, you cleaned it up overnight. That doesn't sound too bad. Tom, what's the whole thing about brass prepping that's so bad? What else <laughs> well, you got to do? So that's just one step, right? Yeah. So uh, first thing I do is I, I run it through a decapping die. So it's not an actual die that's forming the brass at all, but I like to get that spent primer out of there just so that when I'm tumbling it, I can clean up that primer pocket as well a little bit. Mm. So if my first operation, I'll come home and I'll decap everything, meaning that I'll take the spent primer out. And then it will go into a tumbler, just like Jimmy's. It'll either go into stainless steel media. If it's got a lot of wear to it and needs to really be polished up, I'll put it in my wet tumbler. Otherwise, I'll put it in corn cob, and now I've got a piece of prep brass. Now I need to lube the case and resize it, get the dimensions back down to where they belong. You got to lube it? Yep. So you have to you you With any what? any reloader that hasn't had vaseline a, just no, case lube case yeah, lube case some lube. people use yeah, motor oil I mean like lube is another that's like another conversation you can probably do another yep. podcast on that right I've, yeah. al- I've always wanted to say this on the microphone <laughs> you use lanolin 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 <laughs> that's correct lanolin. seriously alcohol and lanolin is the best lube combination out there yeah if you don't right. if you don't lube the case in whatever way you choose you will have a stuck case at some point. And huh. that's a nightmare when that case gets stuck up. If you haven't yeah. had a stuck case, you just haven't reloaded long enough, <laughs> and your first one is going to cost you some time, yeah. and it's probably going to cost you a trip to the store. I'm sure there's some homemade, you know, things that you can do to get it out. But I just went and took the easier route and bought the little stuck case remover, is what it's called. Yep. 
And uh, it happens enough that somebody decided it was a good idea to oh, yeah. manufacture a stuff case for removable. Oh, there's lo- lo- every loading lots of, shop sells them. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> lots of lots of debate yeah. over what is the best stuff case remover too. I've oh, also man. found a replacement set of dies is a very good stuff case remover. <laughs> <laughs> <So, laughs> <Yep. laughs> depends on how good and stuck you got it. Mm, so yeah. so now you've resized the case. Now you need to you have to measure the case and make sure that it hasn't grown too much and that it's not past its trim length. If it's past its trim length, then I'm going to advocate, and this is another topic of contention, but I always trim to whatever the, the specifications are. So I find that with I'm, with not annealing and with the amount of working that my brass is getting, I usually have to trim every second to third firing, maybe every third to fourth firing. Um, so now you've had to trim the brass. You're trimming it. It's weird because that material was always there. Yeah, but you're moving but now, it around. When, yeah. you, when you fired, it forms to the chamber. Yep, it's expanding during the firing, but then you're moving it back into place. And so that brass, that brass isn't, that mine isn't work hardened. So, like, my brass is probably moving more, I would guess. Than, Does it get a little stretched then? Is that, yeah. is that how you yeah. describe yep. what's happening? Yep, so it, it actually stretches, stretches out, kind of out the end. So then I have to trim that excess off. Uh, so then I trim it, then I chamfer it, and I deburr it. And then I sometimes choose to or not to clean my primer pockets. And so now you have a piece of prep brass then the rest is pretty easy in my eyes. Then it's a primer, powder, and bullet. But it's all that stuff leading up to that. And it's you can make it... I know I know guys like Ryan said that, that they tumble and then resize and then go straight to the press. I will say too, maybe I don't need to do this, but because I've got all that lube on the case from resizing, it goes back into the tumbler before I actually load it. So oh. now I've got that... I've, I've dirtied the case again just in a different way. So now I have to tumble it and. Oh wait, get wait! It. So the case lube isn't on when you're actually like shooting the gun? No, no. no. Oh, that can be that can be very the, yeah. That can uh, be very dangerous. dangerous. Okay. Well, yeah. At first, that's why you're talking yeah. about. Oh, I get it. Now I get it. So all this stuff is done. Is it? Hey, is this the same for pistol? No. Dep- well, it depends on your pistol. I can weigh in on that. On the actual pistol itself. No, I did cartridge. Oh, the cartridge. So a goofy case that I reloaded for is called the five point seven by twenty eight. Put um, that FN. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, so, it's so cool. It's a little neat, zippy thing. Neat little cartridge, right? And it, um, I had a very good friend of mine that bought uh, an FN 5.7 pistol and then an FN P90. And then he had a bolt action Remington 700 chambered in it. No. Yeah, yeah. He got a PTG manufacturing bolt. It was a single shot. It was the cutest thing you've ever seen. And he's like, hey, load for me because we can turn this cartridge that, again, on paper seems rather anemic into some... Thing that maybe it was never intended to be. A couple things I learned. Loading bottleneck pistol cases is a very interesting process. And then two, uh, FN 5.7 brass is turned from solid bar stock, hmm. which is very different in the process of brass production. Hmm. And you can only load it a maximum of two times. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Is that because it's turned? Is it like, yeah. a, it's not as hardened or something? It's, it's, it's not, not it's not as strong. So yeah, when you look at the case, like you look at the outside diameter, that was the maximum diameter of this rod, right? Yeah. And so they shaped it a particular way, but they had to like trim the neck thinner. So the neck is very thin on a 5.7 by 28. And, and the processes may have changed as I was loading for it. But notice after the second firing, the cases were always split. Every single one of them. Didn't matter how we loaded it, how careful the practice was. It drove me bonkers. Oh, um, sounds safe. Because if you're, <laughs> yeah, because if you're tri- if you're just trimming metal and you're not like like hardening it in any yeah. kind of way, then the grains of the metal essentially are. Well, I, shoot, I I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, you're you're a hundred percent. It's like billet yeah. versus forged, yep. right? Billet, yep. you can make nicer, fancier things, but it's not as inherently strong. Exactly as forged, correct. Right? Exactly correct. And uh, so yeah, that that that's a little goofy. But with pistol cases, so I'm just going to single out like nine millimeter and forty five auto. You can you can generally get away with less brass prep, like countering what Tom had said. So when I when I pick up nine millimeter from the range after I've shot up either a match or I've just been out shooting recreationally, I'll take it back and I'll clean it using a, either a vibratory tumbler like Jim had mentioned, or I use my stainless steel tumbler without any of the stainless steel in it. So I'm literally just putting it in a bucket filled with water and dish soap, and I'm rotating it and washing dirt and debris up off of the case. From here, I then run it through my press and with straight walled cartridges, meaning it doesn't have a a shoulder or a neck like... Like 9 mil and 45 and stuff, right? Yeah, so they're just straight. Just looks like a garbage can with a little thing sticking out of it. If you use... Bullet Bob. uh, Yeah, (laughs) Bullet Bob. If you use a 
particular type of dye called a carbide dye, you don't need to lubricate them. So the process is like sped up exponentially. So I use carbide dyes. I don't have to lubricate them. Um, I don't trim them. I've never trimmed a pistol case. I could untold tens of thousands of rounds have passed through my press. Never lube or uh, trimmed a single one pistol case, hmm. not straight wall case anyway, or or like a nine or a forty. I should say I've, I've trimmed three fifty seven. Now that I mentioned that, gosh. Uh, but yeah, it it so it is a little different with pistol than it is rifle. But but um, yeah, it, it's case preps an arduous process with a bottleneck cartridge, hmm. pistol cartridge not so much. Clean them, load them. Do you prefer loading pistol over rifle or rifle over uh, pistol? Or? I mean, it's like a different thing, though. Like when I'm loading for pistol, it's like, so with 9 millimeters specifically, I reduce the charge weight to make my pistol shoot a particular way to get the job done. Oh, is that because you want your pistol to be a light felt recoil? Correct, yeah. So For competition use, right? Exactly. Because you're not like, you're not trying right. to shoot a 9 mil at 100 yards. You're trying to just right. like up close and personal. Knock, over a, steel, knock over a steel target or put two holes in a piece of cardboard. Yeah, I see. You just want your slide to move back and go forward and not yeah. really, like, jump a whole lot. Correct. So I'm reducing the load intentionally over what you would buy factory to, mm. to like, fairly anemic levels and uh, just enough to function reliably and then shoot well. And uh, in that sense, like, I can load a lot of ammunition in a short amount of time, but it's way less sexy. When I'm looking at a pile of 9 millimeter I made, I'm like, oh, you guys will do the job. When I load, like, a, a high-performance rifle cartridge or something interesting – I got into shooting black powder cartridges. I have not ventured into loading black powder yet. I will uh, when I have a safer space to, to load black powder. But to accomplish something different with a rifle cartridge like my 4570s now, to look at a pile of those, a smaller number like 20 or 50 of them that are loaded in a very special way, like that is way cooler to me than a bucket of 9mm or 45 mm. just because they're, they're just neater. They do things cooler. Neat. Yeah. You're accomplishing two vastly different things. Uh, with absolutely two correct. Piles of ammo. Yeah. Like one is a strictly volume. Yep. Yep. And the other is application. You know, and application. And, yeah. In the process. And mm-hmm. well, and it's interesting hearing him talk because he makes it sound a lot easier. So part of me is thinking, man, I should have got into loading pistol. But I think the thing that's always scared me about pistol is that you can double charge a pistol case, whereas or not most charge one or not charge them. But mm-hmm. with with rifle cases there aren't many rifle cases that I know of that you can really double charge. No. And so, you know, your your highest likelihood of hurting yourself or someone else is by using the wrong powder combination or by having too much powder in the case. And with a rifle, I'm not going to say that it's impossible, but if you're using the right type of powder, it's really hard to to do True. catastrophic damage. Whereas Just with pistol... Super blow up. Yeah, but with a pistol, you can double charge that case, so you have to be... With, even with the right powder. Yeah, although oh, yeah. he's making it sound safe, and it is, you need definitely need to watch that powder drop and make sure that you're not double charging a, a case. What you would know? happen in a Glock if you double charge? Uh, with a 9 millimeter and the powder I use, nothing. It'll go bang louder, cycle harder. The piece of brass is probably shot. So, yeah. I mean, a modern metallurgy is exceptional, and you can get away with a lot of things. And so there, there's actually a practice... And, and now kind of a, a, it's not a different cartridge, but it's when you load it to this capacity, it's considered a different cartridge. It's called nine millimeter major. And so you're going to read this term or hear this term specifically in USPSA, IDPA, and similar action pistol shooting. It's where you take a standard nine millimeter case and you overcharge it deliberately to bring your velocities up to accomplish a term called power factor. Again, this is a very strange um, and and not often discussed or discovered thing Power at your factor nine millimeter major this is all sounding like yeah, smash pros it's it is <laughs> it, it, yeah it's con- yeah. it's all competition based so you're you're deliberately overcharging a case with like double the powder and depending on the powder it could be more than double to to get a bullet going a particular velocity um you can shoot it one time the case is completely destroyed after that it can't be reloaded again but, you know, you, you can't do it. So, like, worst case scenario with a 9 millimeter, I, I, I can't say for sure. I've never double charged. I don't believe I have. I've seen them go off. Um, and it's usually just, you, you can tell on the cadence, you know, the guy shooting bang, 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 boom, bang, bang, bang. And it, it's not. The boom t- is the double charge. Correct. Okay. Right. If you're looking at a cartridge, <laughs> if you're looking at a, a, a larger cartridge, let's say a 357 Magnum or a 44 Magnum or Ooh, yeah. or something like that, like then the implications of danger could probably... Well, because like a 357 is likely in a revolver too, yeah. which doesn't have a nice 
big, thick, meaty slide going no, back and forth. No, it just not has so much. Your hand to go into. So I mean, the, the meaty hand. Mm, yeah. yeah, there, there is certain. If you're me, <laughs> there is certainly you know some steps and in process checks that you can do when you're loading in large volume to prevent that. I've got a special die called a powder cop. So my case runs up into it and pushes a stick up. If the stick goes either too high or too low, it makes a beep. If it beeps, I pull it down and look at it and see if there's powder in it or not. Hmm. So, yeah, there's ways to get around it. I'm policing your uh, your process. Correct. Per Jim's very early disclaimer in this podcast, should we briefly cover if a person is or is planning on reloading both rifle and pistol, you know, potential dangers for yeah. powder well, mix-ups. And oh, safe yeah. practices, yeah. I mean, so if you if you put pistol powder in your rifle cartridge, Bad news. blow it up. That yep. ain't good. We've had a scope come back to us. We've had a, we've had a couple. Yeah. Uh, 338 Lapua loaded with, uh, with a pistol, <laughs> uh, a full no. charge, 120-some grains of pistol powder. In it, and uh, yes, we we had a, a gentleman was unfortunate. Uh, his did rifle we, exploded. Did we send that back to the, anybody? Like, I mean, when I say did we send that back, was there anybody to send it back? Yeah, there to? was. He he did survive. Oh, okay, um, good. All right, but uh, covered under the VIP warranty. That's for life. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't a doubt of if we send anything back. It just was. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. So no, Mark Mark makes a great point. I and and I'll, I'll get into this debate with seasoned reloaders um, because they're, they're usually the same personality type. Regardless of how many cartridges you reload, or how often you do it, if you see two types of powder spilled on a table, you will not be able to definitively tell me that it is X or Y unless it's like there's a couple of specialty powders out there where there is only one that looks like that. It is not worth the gamble. If if you have different types of powder, keep them separated. If you're using powder measures and, and powder vials and, and scales and powder dumps, when you're done with that, unload them. Dump that powder back into its respective containers. Do not relabel containers. Do not use containers over again. Uh, it's not worth it. A simple mistake and a double charge on, on the wrong thing, or if you put pistol powder in a rifle, not so much rifle powder in a pistol, but if you if you do that, like you could seriously end up injured or dead. Uh, so it's, it's just not worth the gamble. Just say no. Correct. That's right. Fantastic. Well, can we talk a little bit here too, and I want to make sure, let's try and, as we wrap up, for those like interested in getting into reloading, if you guys had an idea of like the basics that you need to do it. What would that be to get somebody by if they just want to start with one cartridge? And and also maybe even an idea of like what, what is there like a super forgiving or easy cartridge to start loading for or like 223 308 Winchester one of those really forgiving cartridges that have a lot of load data out there on the market for them. The yeah. one in your gun safe. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. So what what should somebody get? Like basics to start with. The internet will tell them they need everything. Yeah. But from as seasoned reloaders, this is all you really actually need. From all of the major manufacturers of reloading presses and components, so dies and otherwise. I, I think that all of them offer a kit that you can purchase. So our friends at Hornady, it's called the Lock and Load. Our friends at RCBS, it's called the the Rock Chucker. Uh, our friends at Lee, it's called the Classic. And it has absolutely everything you need, sands, a set of dies. Um, Which you can your, get from them. Correct. For your whatever, it has to be for whatever cartridge you're shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then your components, like your brass, your projectile, your primer. It has everything you need to load ammunition safely and reliably. And, and to your point, Jim, everybody's on the internet saying, you got to have a digital this, you got to have a mechanical that. My good friend Jim Jordan over here loads on a balance scale. And he Sometimes. shoots <laughs> he shoots ammunition that is flat out fantastic. So Animal. You, you don't need to do you don't need to spend a lot of money. I often if people ask me this question, if, if you have three hundred dollars that you want to invest in this, you can get absolutely up and running for life and require no further investment in equipment. That's it. And then you just need a little blank space on your workbench yeah. downstairs. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Definitely enough to get started, but you will fall into the same trap that every oh, every yeah. old does. Right. You know, like, oh, that beam scale is nice, but that auto charge is really yeah. nice. Makes this go faster. Yeah. Let Let me ask you this too. Now, how does one decide? Like, you look at the three hundred eight. I feel like there's so many different projectiles. 
to choose from. And then there's a bunch of different people that make brass, and you hear people about like, oh, there's a Lapua brass, and it's better than the whatever brass. I don't know. And then different kinds of powders. How do you like? How do you decide what? I mean, because that's an investment. I wouldn't want to go out and buy a ton of powder and a bunch of brass and like, you know, bullets, and then all of a sudden try it out, yeah. and it's just shooting terrible. And then I'm like, why well, now I have all these, and I got to go buy another one. I don't know if that's gonna work. It's kind of part of the process, actually. I mean, you inevitably you're going to end up with pounds of powder that you've only taken a sip out of and boxes of bullets that you have only hand-loaded a few out of. It's just going to happen. It, 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 it seems to be the case. I mean, the, the, the load manuals available nowadays and the quality of component that you're purchasing from any of the major manufacturers is exceptional. These guys, the ballisticians at these companies, have it dialed. So it's very difficult to, say, jump into your Hornady or your Barnes or your Sierra load manuals and find bad data because it's just, it's just not there. Those guys are very good at what they do, but it does happen. How do you choose? Look at the bullet. Look at how it's designed. Look at your task you're trying to accomplish. If you're shooting yeah. long distance, don't buy a hunting bullet. If you're hunting, don't buy a target bullet. Um, so fit your projectile or, or kind of your goal towards your application. Once you've once you've identified that, then yeah. get into the nitty gritty of what makes a bullet special, what makes a powder temperature sensitive, what makes a powder forgiving, that kind of thing. And just experiment. That's half the fun. Hmm. True. Yeah. yeah. We That's fair. we get this a lot. Guys say, well, if you don't use that component, it's going to shoot terrible. I've never loaded a 6.5 Creedmoor in my life. I have shot thousands of 6.5 Creedmoor cartridges. I've never loaded a single 6.5 Creedmoor. I have dyes. I have powder and bullets. I've never loaded it. The factory stuff is so good that I just have not had a need to do it yet. So I've had guys tell me, oh, if you're shooting brand X or brand Y, it's going to shoot terrible. I've shot a lot of point zeros with brand X, and I've shot a lot of point zeros with brand Y. So, you know, get out and experiment with it. Very interesting. Well, all right. Hey, I'd say that was a pretty comprehensive basic rundown of reloading If so, for somebody who's looking to get into it. You guys got anything else as far as like somebody who's listening right now who doesn't have a reloading bench in their basement, but they're like, I want to be a weirdo in my basement loading bullets. You guys got anything else? Toss have in. Have fun. Be safe. <laughs> be careful. Wise words. Well, hey, as we close out here, we did get a suggestion in from somebody said, hey, Maybe your last calls could use a little more spice. So, with that said, we're going to have MC Ryan do his thing here. MC Ryan, take it away. Mark, there you have it. I like that a lot. Done. In that case, we'll just close with a nice bye. 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 See ya. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. Leave us a review or comment down below. We want to hear what you have to say about the show, maybe what you like, maybe what you didn't like, so that way we can make these podcasts as good as they can be. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'll be posting about each episode released, so that way you can go back, find these things, maybe grab a little nugget of information that you could take with you to the range, out in the field, or uh, maybe to the kitchen if we're talking about some good food. So, again, everybody, thanks, and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.